Hello guys, welcome to a new format here on my channel um, which I will call the lab report or TPAI lab report um, in which I will uh, frequently inform you about what I'm doing right now here in the lab or around the house or anywhere else for that matter and uh, the idea behind this is basically that yeah, as you know it takes me some time to upload new content and that's simply because uh, um, I'm working on a lot of detailed problems and I want to solve these problems before I upload my videos um, because uh, I actually want you to uh, learn something and that's only possible if I um, know how things work myself and that is something that doesn't fall from the sky you know you have to put work into things look at the details even if you know a lot about electronics already um, in every device that you turn apart there will be surprises it's uh, of course when I start a project I have a rough understanding or a rough idea of how things work what to expect inside uh, what will be the uh, components used and so on uh, but each time you go into the details um, you find something new and something that you uh, want to uh, spend some time on understanding in depth yourself before you can tell anyone else so that's that's one of the reasons why it uh, always takes me like two or three weeks to upload um, a new um, long detailed video about anything and uh, yeah I actually don't want uh, you guys to have uh, to wait so long to hear something new from me and that's uh, the reason why I want to do this new uh, thing and uh, first of all yeah this actually is supposed to be a little bit more off the cuff than my other videos and um, that's uh, why I will have to drink uh, a glass of alcoholic beverage first because I'm an uptight German and uh, that's why I have to drink some alcohol to be spontaneous and funny and that's why I will present you a new segment unmanly man skills um, episode one how to open uh, a bottle of French rosé wine without a corkscrew now what you need is an electric uh, <laughs> power drill with a screw a big one like this is uh, preferable and what you do is you screw it into the cork once it's in there deep enough uh, you take one of your pliers <coughs> and you <laughs> apply a lot of force to pull it out so opening a bottle of French rosé wine without a corkscrew learned something new right and uh, the proper way to drink a French wine is of course uh, out of an old uh, cola glass like this one. <clears throat> mm. Room temperature, always the best. Okay guys, um, let's be serious. Um, let me tell you something about the things that I have lying here on the bench uh, because I guess that's what you're actually more interested in. Um, the parts you see here are um, uh, the components of two different welding machines that I'm reverse engineering at this moment. Um, the first unit um, is a fairly modern type uh, welding inverter. It's the Elektra Beckum uh, model which you could see in my uh, How Welding Transformers Work video. Um, I already um, repaired most of the circuitry. Uh, but I'm still waiting for some uh, replacement parts at the moment and uh, that's why I'm a little bit uh, stuck on this project. I uh, also still have to reverse engineer um, this module right here and uh, reverse engineering a module really isn't fun because uh, in this case for example you have 20 pins down here and uh, without uh, having mapped out uh, the main board before uh, it is quite hard uh, to intuitively um, reverse engineer something like this because you don't know where these leads actually lead and that um, makes it uh, more difficult. Uh, even more difficult uh, is uh, the fact uh, that this is a two layer board or double layer board um, which uh, makes it harder to see where the connections are between the different components. 
um, but uh, all in all it uh, won't be that difficult because it's um, a standard path with uh, modulation controller the uh, SG3525 uh, um, which I dealt before uh, in other devices and also the LM358 uh, which is uh, simply a uh, standard uh, op amp as, uh, as long as I remember. Um, uh, the second unit that we have here is a much uh, bigger uh, MIG welding machine uh, that you haven't seen yet uh, in my videos and uh, it will also be a kind of um, a surprise and I don't want to take that away from you but uh, we can still take a look at some of the components uh, see some of the difficulties that I'm having and so on um, so uh, these are some parts from a uh, uh, 4.8 kilovolt ampere uh, welding machine. It's really a gigantic machine with a three-phase transformer weighing about 200 kilograms. Um, it's a German make uh, from 1967 and we have a lot of quality parts, also some odd parts like this huge air core inductor, uh, the likes of which I haven't seen before. Um, we also have a um, separately excited DC motor which is something that you don't see in any modern application basically and uh, in order to control that motor we have a uh, thyristor based phase fired control circuit um, the thyristors themselves are also very old school um, and I had to look up the part numbers on the um, semiconductor comparison chart uh, because I couldn't find anything online really. Um, we have an old school um, axial fan that is based on a um, induction motor with motor capacitor. It's also an, an interesting part. Um, we have um, different kinds of uh, proprietary um, parts uh, which might have to be replaced altogether. Um, we also have physical damages like this broken uh, copper tube right here and I'm thinking at the moment if I will repair this part or if I will um, exchange this entire um, slot or jack here with a um, modern type um, connector. Um, yeah, we also have uh, a lot of um, really well made mechanical parts like this uh, unit here which is part of the wire feeder. So you can see we have like massive brass parts and um, some uh, German made bearings and everything is like made of very thick welded metal. Um, so this is um, an interesting unit but there are at least uh, let's say between 5 and 10 faults that will have to be repaired. Um, yeah. And maybe we can talk uh, a little bit about my reverse engineering methods. Um, now that we are here. Um, if you um, take a closer look you will see that we have little labels here and there and uh, that is something that I actually do a lot when taking apart um, devices. As you will know from some of my earlier videos um, I uh, make photographs of the insides of my devices when I take them apart uh, before repairing them and I do a, s a similar thing uh, when reverse engineering. For example here we have the large uh, three-phase transformer of the welding machine and uh, you will see a lot of labels everywhere and that is um, something that I always do when I take apart pieces simply to measure them out to take them uh, take a closer look at them and um, yeah if uh, at the same time I make uh, uh, video recordings of it so I can later see uh, where which part was actually mounted on and so on but uh, having these labels is uh, still a very good uh, backup plan if you can't really see what you did on your video or if you can't remember then uh, you will be able to um, uh, reassemble the device without any huge problems and uh, Earlier on in the process all the parts which are on the bench over there uh, originally had uh, much more tags on them. I simply took them away over time because I am, um, uh, as I'm reverse engineering I have a lot of paper sheets like these here and um, I make um, 
um, little circuit diagrams of all the different functional units like for example the uh, auxiliary transformer which delivers all the voltages for the uh, motor control for the fan for the control lamp um, and stuff like that and then I will map out the relays how they are connected together um, like in this case a, a cable is leading from the actual welding machine to the wire feeder and that has to be mapped out and uh, yeah I still have to reverse engineer the actual uh, phase fired controller though because I maybe will replace it with a modern type uh, switching converter um, I also make a list of different things that still have to be op uh, like open questions, problems or things that I have seen while doing the reverse engineering which are not um, part of the original design so there someone has been mucking around with this unit and uh, that means that there is some uh, reason to believe that not everything that I find um, is in the way it should be. Uh, so. Uh, this is a method that uh, looks chaotic at, um, at the start because I have a lot of paper sheets but um, there will be different stages. I will so to speak simplify my own drawings. Here you see like the first drawing of a certain uh, yeah it's, uh, it's like a clamp that uh, connects the two units of the device the wire feeder uh, on the one hand side and the machine on the other hand side and as you can see it looks quite complicated we have like all kinds of um, um, all kinds of wires going around and the colors of the wires and different numbers and so on but after I had um, put everything together in my head and understood it I could simplify the whole thing to this so that it is uh, in, in, the, in the final version of this plan there won't even be these uh, connectors anymore. We will just have a pure, simple circuit diagram that everybody can understand. But uh, to create something like this uh, from a device that you find that has been mucked around with by someone else and is 50 years old and super dirty takes a lot of time. Especially if you're planning to really reuse the unit after you have taken it apart. And in my case, it's taken, it will take even more time because I also want to modify the original circuits um, because some modern electronics could further boost the capabilities of this old timer. Yeah, um, that's basically how I'm working. So at the end, this will be, one be, uh, be replaced by one large piece of paper that contains the actual uh, circuit diagram of the device. And uh, once that is done, I will um, make another plan on which my changes uh, will be um, visible. Yeah, and um, we can uh, take a look again at some of the parts, and I will tell you something about uh, uh, how it can sometimes be uh, difficult to do reverse engineering. Uh, one example is, uh, for example, this. Um, um, heat sink right here it holds an old diode and two uh, thyristors and uh, thyristors came up at the end of the 1950s and were used as the main switching device in power electronics for many decades um, today they are largely being replaced by MOSFETs and IGBTs but if you take apart older welding machines maybe even welding machines that are 20 years old or maybe even 15 years old um, maybe even some that have uh, just made, been made recently will still have thyristors in them. Um, and in this case, these things are so old that it was really hard to even find out the pinout um, or for which currents they're rated and so on. And uh, these th uh, thyristors, as I said, are not uh, part of the welding machine itself, but uh, are part of the motor control circuit of the wire feeder. Um, these are two 10 ampere units, so they wouldn't be able to um, uh, have any meaningful job in the welding machine itself. Um, the rectifiers for the welding machine are not SC SCRs, but just normal silicon diodes. But then we have uh, 24 of them connected together on this uh, heat sink right here. And I also first had to um, do some measurements right here. Um, to find out how they are connected together. It's uh, at the end just what I expected a uh, three-phase um, 
uh, rec a rectifier um, which is capable of handling around 200 amperes and um, you can make um, a rough calculation in your head that at a voltage drop between let's say 0, um, 0 0.7 and 1 volts um, at a maximum current of 200 amperes that you will have a power dissipation between 140 and 200 watts and that's uh, the reason why the fan is sitting next to this heatsink. Um, um, another problem that I'm uh, having at the moment is that this um, gearbox which is sitting in front of this DC motor here is actually leaking. There has been a lot of uh, oil, there has been really an, <laughs> kind of an oil spill inside uh, the um, enclosure of the wire feeder and I still am not sure how to get this tight. I mean you could put some kind of silicone or glue on it or so. I wish I had some seal that would fit in here but yeah, if any one of you has an idea how you can um, make a seal that would fit um, all around this box here, this rectangular shape, and that could be cut by hand, if you know what kind of base material you would use for that, then please let me know because um, I'm stuck here. I don't really know how to get this um, thing tight again. Um, <clears throat> another thing that you really have to take um, or that you have to pay attention to when reverse engineering is that parts that look alike do not necessarily have the same properties. For example these two relays right here have um, basically the same enclosure also if you look at the name plates you will see that they have the same um, name and so on but if you look uh, through this uh, small window right here you will see that this is actually a 24 volts unit and this a 220 volts unit and um, that is a voltage rating for the um, electromagnet that uh, pushes down uh, the switches. So uh, if you would uh, put this together again and replace these two, um, the 24 volt relay would be um, going up in flames if you connected it to 220 volts for a longer period of time. Um, this is also an example uh, where you can see that someone mucked around with this device because of these horrible uh, soldering jobs here. Uh, it's been years since I've seen something that putrid. And uh, yeah, if I open a device and I see something like this, um, yeah, it really is, is a bummer because if it's old and dirty, okay, but if it's not in its original state anymore and you have no uh, schematic well, you have to do some leaps of uh, faith sometimes to test the unit. But um, to be honest, um, once I spent a certain amount of time with parts like these, um, with, with devices like these, I have taken the time to analyze the different components, how they work and so on, I actually always get the thing running again. Sometimes I might rewire things a little differently than they were before, but I know what I'm doing so it won't blow up or anything. Another oddball component in here is actually this thing. It's a bi-stable relay and you can see this little wheel shaped thing here on the side which is um, poked by the electromagnet and uh, which is actually um, triggering the relay so you just have to put a pulse on it. That's when you push a button while welding and um, it will uh, go in the on or off state. So you have to push the button again for the welding machine to turn off again. Um, this is also something which I uh, didn't realize uh, before very late. Um, and while reverse engineering something like this can really be a problem because if you look at it and you think oh, okay it's just a relay um, then you will not really understand how the device works if you do not know that it's a bi-stable relay and that's something that I really just um, found out very late in the process and <laughs> yeah that was um, a little bit stupid so uh, one piece of advice that I really can give is to take a really a close look at the different components um, spend a lot of time understanding them read off the name plates I often don't really uh, re read the name plates um, with all that much attention and that's a mistake <laughs> Also on this uh, little transformer right here, or yeah, in my case it's a little transformer, 
um, you actually have a label that tells you all the different uh, all the different voltages that you can uh, get from it. And this was very dirty when I pulled it out of the device, and I couldn't see that there were numbers on there. So I, what I really did is I. It took me a lot of time to map out this transformer, you know, I hooked it up to the isolation, isolation transformer, measured all the voltages and so on, uh, while I simply could have read them off and it was simply because I didn't um, clean it off uh, first thing, you know, and that's uh, one more reason why I really recommend you to do what I'm doing a lot in my videos and that is to open something and to clean it right away because otherwise you might simply not see writings inside the device that really might spare you hours of work. <clears throat> okay, um, I don't uh, want to go into too much detail here anymore because uh, you will actually hear about this hopefully soon in a video in which I will explain how this welding machine actually works. There is one more thing that I wanted to ask you for. Please visit this channel, Electromechanical Paul. He's making electronics videos, is from the UK and is a really likable guy. So he deserves to get some more views. So if you find the time, check out his channel. You can find a link in the video description. Okay, so this is my first attempt at making a more spontaneous kind of video in which I also show unfinished work, which is something that I normally don't like. Um, but I guess it would be good if I could get used to it. Uh, please tell me what you're thinking about this idea. Uh, please consider that this will not affect my regular work really, because um, it only takes me a few hours or less than that to make a video of this kind. And um, it's just... Uh, yeah, my attempt to get in touch uh, with the fan base and yeah, being able to upload something every week or so instead of every two or three weeks, which is uh, simply the way it was until now. But okay, long story short, I hope you liked this and see you soon.